and welcome to Finding What's New and What's Old, Gender in World War I. My name is Vicki, and I will be in the background answering any WebEx technical questions. If you experience technical difficulties at any time during this WebEx event, you may contact WebEx Technical Support at 1-866-229-3239, or you may submit your technical issue via the Q&A panel, and I will attempt to assist you. We do encourage everyone to use the audio broadcasting, but if you would like to join the teleconference via the phone, you will need to close the audio broadcasting box and request the phone by clicking on the phone icon below the participant list. It will then provide you with the dial-in number, along with the event number, and your personal attendee ID number. We will be holding a Q&A session at the conclusion of today's presentation. You may ask an online question at any time throughout the presentation today by simply clicking on the question mark icon located on the floating toolbar in the bottom right side of your screen. Please send questions to all panelists. Today's webinar is being recorded, and the link to the recording will be made available to everyone through their email. With that, we invite you to sit back, relax, and enjoy today's presentation. I would now like to introduce you to your moderator for today, Dr. Tom Kelly, head of school. Dr. Kelly, you now have the floor. Thank you, Victoria. Good evening to our alumni, faculty, and friends. Thank you for joining us this evening for the third in our series of webcasts by Horace Mann School faculty. The series has been developed to help celebrate our 125th anniversary. Tonight's presentation features three members of our upper division history department, Drs. Milks, Paterano, and Grappi. Entitled Finding What's New and What's Old, Gender in World War I, tonight's presentation is designed to demonstrate how history assignments at Horace Mann School ask students to engage in critical and analytical thinking. The presentation will illustrate how an approach to a very traditional topic can be used to elicit a variety of answers and responses through creative questions. Thank you for joining our virtual classroom. We hope that as you did when you were students here, you have questions and comments to share with all of us at the end of the presentation. Horace Mann School is dedicated to preparing a diverse community of students to lead great and giving lives, and our alumni community exemplifies our success in fulfilling this mission. Our next alumni faculty webcast will occur in early May, and it will feature members of our service learning team talking about their good work in and around the Bronx. And without further ado, members of our upper division history department. Thanks, Tom. Uh, I'm Elisa Milks. Welcome, and thank you to everyone for joining us. Our webcast title, Finding What's New and What's Old, sums up one of our goals in the history department, seeing the past more fully and more accurately by introducing new interpretive perspectives. That means, in more concrete terms, combining a traditional political narrative with a newer social history approach, one that looks at ordinary people, including women, about whom we know far more now than, than we did when all of us went to high school. One great example of achieving this combination between political and social history is our study of World War I in ninth grade. There's no question that World War I is a key moment for understanding the 20th century, which opened with this stunning outburst of violence. It's not hard to see in this war the roots of later conflicts. You can draw a line between the failure of the Versailles Treaty that ended World War I and the failed policy of appeasement that began World War II, between the Armenian Genocide and the Holocaust, between the Russian Revolution and the Cold War between Wilson's 14 points and decolonization in Asia and Africa. And we could keep going. We could, we could be here all night. Um, there's connections between the fall of the Ottoman Empire and the rise of Arab Spring, between the League of Nations and the United Nations. So it's really easy to illustrate that this war shaped the 20th century and arguably the 21st century as well. We clearly need to study this war and figure out what caused it. As briefly as I can, I'd like to highlight for you parts of the political narrative that students read about and discuss. Hopefully, much of this is still familiar to you, and if not, I'm confident it will all come back. For the more long-term causes of World War I, we could point to the rise of nationalism, especially in the Balkans and Austria-Hungary, where there was no real consensus on which states could and would be independent. 
We also need to consider the development of social Darwinism that encouraged a view of war as natural. War is just another version of the survival of the fittest. And you can see that nationalist social Darwinist competition heat up as imperialist states jostled for power in Africa, nearly all of which was carved up by European states. We see something similar in Asia with the carving out of spheres of influence. Some commentators at the time welcomed war, hoping it would erase the class divides that erupted with increasing frequency in large-scale strikes and other labor actions. And there was, of course, the military dimension, the intensified naval arms race between Germany and Great Britain, the growth of massive conscript armies, and the formation of intricate, inflexible war plans, the most famous being Germany's 1905 Schlieffen Plan, that often put politicians in a policy straitjacket with very little wiggle room once military demands were on the table. And crucially for European diplomacy was the collapse of the Bismarckian alliance system after 1890, when the German Emperor Wilhelm II dumped his ruthless but talented chancellor, Otto von Bismarck, and you can see here in John Tenniel's famous image a puny Wilhelm watching very calmly as the imposing experienced Bismarck departs. Wilhelm must now steer the ship of state on his own. Can he do it? The short answer is no, he cannot. The alliance system that had restrained states was replaced with a new one, dividing Europe into two large blocks, the Triple Alliance of Germany, Austria, Italy, and the Triple Entente of France, Britain, and Russia. How do you protect your security in this age of entangled alliances? You have to support your allies. Peacetime alliances can very quickly turn into the wartime alliances we see here. With the more short-term causes of the war, you can practically hear the dominoes fall one after the other. On June 28, 1914, a member of a Serbian nationalist group, the Black Hand, assassinated the Austrian Archduke and his wife in Sarajevo. Austria, fearing Russian intervention on behalf of the Slavic Serbs, gained full German support, called at the time a blank check. Austria issued Serbia an ultimatum on July 23rd. Serbia accepted some demands, but not all. Austria declared war on Serbia on July 28th, and in very little time, one state after another tumbles into war. So that, in a nutshell, is the political timeline. It's a very standard and important overview of what happened and why it happened. But we still don't know how this war affected ordinary men and women. What happened to them? How did men and women experience total war when industrial powers on both sides poured everything they had into this conflict? with factories turning out machine guns, barbed wire, and poison gas, with railroads moving hundreds of thousands of soldiers to a battlefront that barely moved no matter how hard the opposing armies pounded each other. Well, one way we answer that question about ordinary people is to assign students a paper asking them to consider whether or not World War I reshaped gender roles for men and women. Did the war shake up the status quo, or did the war reinforce it? For this assignment, students read secondary sources, articles, book chapters, excerpts that weigh in on this debate. They then look at primary sources, documents from the time period, by reading a small collection of soldiers' letters. And lastly, they research in online databases to find and analyze images of women and men in wartime. So Susan and Dominique are going to give you a behind-the-scenes look at this assignment and the kinds of facts and interpretations that students encounter as they make their way through all of this material. Hi, <clears throat> excuse me. Hi, I'm Susan Grappi. I'm going to talk about the changing roles or not changing roles of women in World War I. Um, to, to look at how World War I affected traditional gender roles, one of the first things we need to do is start by establishing what a, a traditional women's view was or was seen as in Europe and America at that time. Um, the, the baseline that we're starting from is a traditional view of women as the home caretakers, people who are invested primarily in the private sphere, not the public sphere, so in the home rather than out in the world. Um, 
they're connected, their identities are connected primarily to their families um, as mothers and as wives and caretakers of their children. Um, there's a strong component here of nurturing and of support. They're supporting men. They're not acting as independent agents in the world. We call this a traditional view. It's complicated um, because women as a group have very varied experiences. Wealthy women and working class women have very different lives. British and German and Russian women have very different experiences. Um, whether women are married or widowed or independent also affects their lives. Um, for instance, working class women have always been present in the workforce to a much greater extent than that traditional private sphere view um, allows for. By the time the war began, in most of Europe and in America, young single middle class women were also a huge presence in the workforce. Um, but it was assumed that they would stop working when they got married, so they're often seen as a temporary presence. That said, that's our baseline. There are women who work, but the belief, generally speaking, is that women should be in the home, not out in the world, and that women should be supporting men, not acting independently. That's where we are, more or less, at the beginning of the war. In this paper, we give the students a body of evidence that presents arguments for and against uh, the idea that women's roles changed. In terms of the evidence that supports a change, we start with there's a huge base of documentary evidence in women's own voices, things like letters and diaries, that show women themselves actively rejecting the idea that they can help the war effectively by staying with their traditional feminine roles. One woman who left a scholarship position at Oxford in order to train as a combat nurse wrote home to her parents um, saying, I do not agree that my place is at home doing nothing or practically nothing. Not being a man and able to go to the front, I wanted to do the next best thing. So this shows us an example of women trying to, to find a way to help out in the war and realizing that traditional roles aren't going to give them that level of freedom. What we see during the war, some women are very active in the actual military side of the, of the war effort. There are a lot of examples of women whose work in the war seems to go very far beyond what we think of as a support capacity. Um, one way that women got involved was by uh, organizing and staffing wartime medical units. There are women who undertake espionage missions. And in a few cases, women act in very high profile ways as ambulance drivers and stretcher bearers at or near the front line. This is a picture of women training for work as uh, military truck drivers. And this is a picture from the British Red Cross of women scrambling at an ambulance drill. In some cases, women actually fight directly in combat. Uh, the most famous example of this is the Women's Battalion of Death, which is organized by the Russian government shortly after the overthrow of Tsar Nicholas. Um, it's an all-female combat unit that is specially trained and does actually fight at the front lines alongside male soldiers. After the war, they're honored for their patriotic service in combat. The best known image of women's contribution to the war happens in industry. Women work in large numbers in the war industries, entering that out of the home workforce in very large numbers. Women's work is absolutely essential in the war industries, uh, most famously filling ammunition shells, but doing other types of industrial work. We have here a picture of women working at a shipyard um, and just general factory work that supports the industrial effort. One French general famously remarked that if women in the war factories stopped for even 20 minutes, we should lose the war. In addition to this industrial work, women do a great deal of support work. Uh, Dr. Milks mentioned that, there was, that this is a modern industrial war. This means that there's a huge effort in terms of industrial output, but also bureaucratic support that's needed to supply this large modern industrial army. Women serve as clerks, as typists, as kitchen help, and in other kinds of industrial support, or rather military support, which is seen at the time as absolutely vital to supporting this kind of modern army that the nations of Europe are, are putting together. Most countries are reluctant at first to welcome women into the workforce in large numbers, but so many men are being removed from the workforce for combat service that it's made necessary. And as the war goes on, it's seen as necessary outside of directly war-related industries. Women begin moving into uh, more public roles as things, the, one of the best examples is as streetcar operators, but there are a lot of other examples of women moving into work, public work outside of the home, largely because of the shortage of men. Once it becomes necessary and this work becomes accepted, it also seems obvious to everyone throughout Europe that women are fully capable and competent workers. The work women are given, they do well and they do effectively. 
And that's a position that would have been very controversial, controversial even shortly before the war. So the work that women do here supports the idea that they can work, which wasn't an idea that was very prominent beforehand. So all of this adds up to a, a body of evidence suggesting that women's roles during the war are fundamentally different than they had been before. There's also a lot of evidence to support the other position, that the war actually essentially reinforces gender roles. In very, except for very rare cases, combat is still a men's occupation during the war. When the women work in a support capacity, that is in some ways reinforcing the idea that what women do is support men's work. Um, the men are doing the important work of fighting, the women are still caretakers and, and support staff. The Russian Women's Battalion is, is the primary example of women that fight, and in many ways it's the only example of women that fight actively in combat. And even they're a complicated example because within Russia, the original purpose of the Women's Battalion was, depending on who you ask, either to boost the morale of the fighting men or to shame the Russian men into doing their service to the country on the idea that we're going to send women into this war to show you that you're not going to step up. So um, in this view, even something like the Russian battalion does actually support the idea that women's roles were reinforced, not changed. The more common way that women served in the army was as, was as nurses. They had a very prominent role during the war um, as combat nurses. But even that can be seen as a traditionally feminine occupation. Again, support staff for the doctors rather than actual independent agents. Um, also, nursing is within a lot of societies seen as a support or nurturing role in of itself, not so much a medical or active one. Also, in the industrial work, in all of the countries that bring women into war industries, their work is pitched as explicitly emergency work. Um, they come in at very low wages, and the expectation is set at the beginning that they'll give up those jobs when the men return home from the front. And that's this poster from the YWCA supports to some extent that idea. Girls must work that men may fight, the implication being when the men are done fighting, the girls don't have to work anymore. One historian has even suggested that a close look at the employment statistics shows that in most European countries, the women who are in wartime industrial work are women who had already been working. Those women I mentioned at the beginning, working class women and young single middle class women. If this is true, the war industry work doesn't actually mean that women who had been in the private sphere are moving into the public sphere. What it means is that women who had been working anyway are shuffled out of industries like domestic service and into industries like war work, but it's not actually fundamentally changing the question of who works and who doesn't work. Finally, in terms of the broader question of how women are perceived by society, so not so much what women do, but how women are seen, a lot of wartime propaganda posters present women as keepers of or representatives of the home. Um, what men fight for is the protection of women because women can't protect themselves. This imagery also further supports the idea that women's roles don't change. The other significant depiction of women that shows up in this wartime propaganda is on traditional domestic views. Women help the war without changing either society or gender roles. They just do things like cooking, which they would have done anyway. They just do it more efficiently. The last point I want to make um, is that some of the evidence we present in this paper shows that the, the question of women's roles and their changing or reinforcing becomes even more complicated when you look at what happens after the war. And a lot of the students are very interested in this. What happens during the war is one thing, but does everything just go back to normal? And to a large extent, it does. Women leave the workforce in large numbers, if supporting the idea that their work was not a shift for them, it was just a kind of filling in as emergency or honorary men. The public rhetoric in most countries after the war is that women have to return home to create or recreate an idea of normal life. And the sense of normalcy or the return to normalcy is, le is legislated in some countries. And throughout Europe, women who attempt to hold their industrial work are criticized in newspaper editorials and in political speeches as being selfish or unnatural. So in that way, it's very hard to deny that women's roles after the war are essentially the same as they were before. One thing that changes enormously and stays changed is women's perception of themselves. Participating in the war effort seems to have reinvigorated women's rights and other feminist movements. People throughout Europe note how difficult it is to persuade women to return to normal and accept their pre-war roles. Primary sources from the women themselves show how deeply the wartime service affected their identities and their sense of self. 
one Russian aristocrat who served as a combat nurse, describes the effect her experience had on her by saying, I spread my wings and tested my strength. The walls, which for so long had fenced me off from reality, are now finally pierced. Women's war work is also often cited as a contributing factor in the wave of female suffrage that sweeps Europe and the U.S. shortly after the war. Having made a patriotic contribution, the argument goes, women have now earned full citizenship. Um, so that's sort of the both sides on the roles of women, um, the evidence that we give the students showing that the roles change or that they fundamentally don't change. Hi, my name is Dominique Paterano, and I'll be discussing the um, men's roles during the war and after the war. As we see with women, the evidence is contradictory. Some of the uh, evidence, such as the poster of Uncle Sam saying, I want you for the U.S. Army, on the left side of your screen suggests that men's roles, such as bravery and self-sacrifice, were still continuing during the war. Men were required to maintain their traditional, quote unquote, masculine, masculine roles during the war. However, the trauma that men experienced during the war, both physical, mental, and emotional, suggests that many times men weren't able to live up to those traditional roles. And we do see some evidence pointing to a change in men's roles after the war. Um, we see a lot of pop culture uh, promoting this traditional view of men during, in order to recruit men into the war. The poster, A Wonderful Opportunity for You, completely elides any suggestion of trench warfare and suggests that the war will, especially joining the Navy, may be something like a Hawaiian cruise. Um, in addition, the po very popular song, which I'm sure you've all heard over there, suggests that men need to call upon their, um, their capacity to threaten others, such as the lyric, send the word to beware, and also need to maintain some sort of tenacity, such as the line, and we won't come back till it's over over there, suggests. In addition, um, as we look at the rest of the uh, as we look at the rest of the song over there, um, we also see gender sort of um, it, it intervening in this as well. The, the lyric "Make your mother proud of you" suggests that women are behind men in this way, and that in order to gain the love and admiration of their women folk, men need to go out do the quote-unquote patriotic thing and join the army. Um, joining the army wasn't the only way in which men could participate in the war. As we see in this last slide here, um, men could be soldiers, and a really important component of service during the war was also industrial service. And in many posters we see um, men, and, and as well as women, such as uh, Dr. Grappi talked about, uh, being encouraged to work quickly, to work with assuredness so that, they're, so that the products, the industrial products that they made would be able to help the men at the front. Um, you even get some posters encouraging agricultural workers to do the same thing, there is uh, another poster which encourages cotton farmers to be sure to grow their cotton um, quickly and efficiently so that um, the, the men could be outfitted with what they needed. But as uh, Dr. Milks discussed, new technologies of war made World War I a much more lethal place than it had ever been before. We see um, airplanes dropping bombs really for the first significant time in wartime history. 
We also see the use of machine guns on a large scale where it had really never been used on such a large scale. We also see the use of poison, chemical gases, and of course the devastation of trench warfare. All of these um, new technologies or new strategies of war took their toll on men who were fighting at the front, both, as I mentioned, uh, physically, as we can see here in this next slide, of a man such as so many other men who had a, sort of a prosthetic mask made for his face. And uh, we see the same thing happening with limbs as well. Um, so physically, men came home from the front less than whole. We also see in, for instance, in the letters that we give our students to read, men really betraying emotions that would have made them seem, quote unquote, less than whole men or real men. Men describing the real fear they felt when they were in the trenches, while they were being bombed. Um, and it, it's, it's not a stretch to think that many of these men, of course, felt as though they were not living up to this uh, masculine ideal that had convinced them to go or, it, or that had drafted them into the war in the first place. And so there's a real conflict that we see in men when they come home at the end of the teens and into the beginning of the 20s. This conflict that men experience really manifests itself in many, many different ways. Um, on a sort of larger front, there is the notion among many governments that men needed to somehow be strengthened, be, um, be, their bodies needed to be readied more uh, efficiently than they had during the war. Although, of course, this logic is, is insane because no amount of strengthening one's body can fend off a bomb or can inure one to poison gas, clearly um, the rise of um, two trends, both, bo both bodybuilding as well as eugenics, suggests that many men adopted um, bodybuilding as a way to kind of strengthen their bodies for wartime. Uh, on the left we see uh, a picture of a young Angelo Siciliano, the man who later becomes Charles Atlas, on a 1914 cover of the magazine Physical Culture that was published in Great Britain in which the title was, Are You a Man or Are You a Weakling? So before the war, there was even a lot of worry that men weren't, quote, unquote, ready enough for their, for their military service. After the war, this particular man, Charles Atlas, went on to actually um, become a sort of male beauty contest winner in which he sent both this photograph into the magazine Physical Culture as well as had to send all of his measurements from the circumference of his head down to um, the, the distance between his hip and his ankle. And all of this sort of concern with body measurements and standards really reflects the increasing power of eugenics in American life and, of course, in European life as well. And so there, there was this thought that if we could somehow sort of genetically direct men to become strong, somehow we would be able to avoid the overwhelming loss of life and devastation that we experienced during World War I. Of course, this also manifests itself in other ways. For instance, wartime rationing, um, such as the poster on the left, Save a, Save a Loaf a Week, Help Win the War, gets manifested in the 1920s uh, in a big dieting fa uh, fad. We usually think of dieting as really a concern of women, but even amongst men, there was this belief that if you were less than, quote unquote, the average, you were less than ideal. Nevertheless, it's clear that this ideal was difficult, if not impossible, for many men to live up to. 
this poster from the Canadian Patriotic Fund um, suggests, of course, that the ideal man of this time, in addition to being fit and lean and strong, such as Charles Atlas was, was, of course, also white. Moreover, um, we see that racial discrimination persists against men, even those who served very uh, valiantly and worthily in the war. This is the 369th Infantry Regiment, also known as the Harlem Hellfighters, this very decorated regiment of men who were really celebrated, like many African-American soldiers, in France. However, when many of these African-American soldiers whom the French celebrated returned home and went home to the South, they found that the Jim Crow laws were also still in effect. And so many of them actually wind up leaving the South for the North um, as sort of a testament to the fact that this new ideal um, was very difficult for men to achieve. So this is just a little overview um, to show you that, again, many of these traditional roles of bravery and self-sacrifice um, persisted, especially before the war, in order to get men to join the war effort. But these ideals became increasingly difficult for men to live up to. So I just uh, want to wrap up um, this segment of our presentation by observing that one thing that's really great about this assignment is that students produce a huge range of interesting and creative arguments. Some will say roles for women changed, roles for men did not. Others will claim that nothing much changed for either gender. Still, others will argue that a minor shift but not a major change occurred for both men and women. Students will make distinctions between long-term and short-term changes, between economic and political changes, between changes in Britain, France, and Russia. So there's plenty for them to grapple with. If we had a chance to survey all of you, the HM alums, what you took away from your Horace Mann education, I'm guessing a good proportion would say, HM taught me to think critically. We say it all the time. We hope it's true that you learn to think critically. But what does it really mean? How do we teach students to think critically? In the history department, we do it with assignments like this, assignments that challenge students with conflicting viewpoints and, ask, and that ask them to draw their own conclusions. It's not OK to simply throw up our hands, to give up, and say, we can't know anything. Everyone disagrees. The evidence conflicts. It's just too messy. Instead, we learn that events like World War I are incredibly complex. How could they not be? But we can understand that complexity by navigating our way through contradictory information, by untangling all of the interpretive strands, and by being bold enough to figure out what makes sense, what is more compelling, what stands out. That's what it means to think critically. So we want to open up this discussion to all of you. We're happy to take any of your questions or comments. And we invite you to share your own ideas. What do you think? Did World War I change gender roles? for men and women. Thank you. Type their questions in the chat section, too, to let you know. I also wanted to mention to you that you can type any questions that you have in the chat section of your screen. Right. And I have some questions now to ask, to ask you. And I'll okay. I'll them to you if you would repeat them. Um, <coughs> okay. So it seems like we've got some questions coming in. So um, Greg Zorowski is going to give us the question. Just to make sure that you can hear it, we're going to repeat the question. And then I think. Any, any of us can jump <laughs> in at any time. Great. In, in addition to um, ambulance drivers and nurses who were very important in the war, were, were there any, any number of women physicians, and did it change the, the need for medical education for women both during the war and after the war? Do we know that? I mean, was there a need for more doctors? The, the question was, in addition to the nurses and ambulance drivers who made very important contributions, were there women doctors serving during the war? And if so, or I guess if not, did that change the ideas about women's education in medicine? Um, I do know that there were a number of British 
of women who were doctors who tried to organize themselves. They actually uh, offered themselves to the British government as support staff in the British Army, and the British Army was not interested in having female medical units of, composed of doctors, not nurses. So they instead went and worked for other British allies and were very successful that way. Um, it's actually a great question about the medical education. I, I know that this is a time period where women are beginning to make inroads into medical schools. Um, I actually have no idea if there's a connection to the war. I can imagine that there would be, but I, I don't know for sure. Have any of you ever heard anything? I think, I um, hope I'm remembering this correctly, but I think my understanding is that admissions to metal, medical school during the war starts to loosen up a little bit for women. But when, when the war is over, women are no longer admitted to medical school. So even though, and this is the British case. Okay. So I, that's, my, that's my understanding. Um, if I hope I'm remembering the right war <laughs> and the right country. But in any case, after the war, I think we can agree that it's going to take women some more time, mm -hmm. even, even just to get equal access to higher education, at least as far as medical school goes. Yeah, and I'm, I'm more familiar with the American case than the European, where I know it's a, a slow but steady trajectory through this period. Um, I don't know if the war affects it significantly. Thanks for that question. That was great. Um, I have another question. Um, <coughs> the women who, ser who served uh, on the front and, and, and really saw and experienced the trauma of, of, of the violence of the war, the nurses, the ambulance drivers, et cetera, uh, what was the reception like to them when, when they returned home along with the veterans, both to the United States and to, and to Great Britain? What, were they treated, did they have a special voice in, in, in society, in government, in, in the press uh, because of their experience, or were they marginalized? So the, the question was, the women who did do this kind of combat service, um, combat support service, uh, how, the question, how was how were they treated on their return to their home countries, and did they have a special role in the politics? Um, my sense, I, I believe they were treated, they, the women's contribution in general was very well respected, whether it was the combat service or the industrial work, but um, it doesn't give them any special standing in society afterwards. So they're welcomed back as you know, helpers and people who, who were made very important co patriotic contributions, but yeah, that, that the combat side service is never singled out specifically as what what helps contribute to women's um, standing later. Some some people suggest that women's World War One service gave them the sort of moral standing to push for suffrage because the 19th Amendment does get ratified in 1920. But other historians argue that suffrage for women would have been achieved even without their World War I service. I do think, though, there, there are, for instance, some photographs of women picketing in front of the White House and saying, you know, Mr. Wilson, we served in World War I, or women, women at least, are serving in World War I, why can't we vote? Um, so I do think that, um, you know, that, that link at least was being made in the public consciousness. How much that actually had to do with suffrage is another question. I can add for the British case, at least as far as suffrage goes, um, there's a similar argument that women's service and empowered the women to push for the right to vote, that it changed men's minds as far as women being able to accept political responsibilities because they've accepted wartime responsibilities because they made a sacrifice. But other historians will say, something very similar, that women would have gotten the vote anyway. They were getting very close because of the suffragists and the suffragettes before the war. It's also a very special case in Britain. They had to have a revision of the election law anyway because there was a law in Britain that you had to spend a certain amount of time in the country. You had to be a resident before you could vote. Well, with all of these young men going off to serve on the Western Front, they were no longer eligible to vote. So there had to be a reform of that election law. So historians will say, since it was going, there was going, had to be an election reform for men, um, that was clear that adding women in wasn't that much of a shift, that it was basically a natural development. So did the war have much to do with women getting the right to vote? It's definitely a debate. But I will say, I, I often, I occasionally have students who raise this point, either in class or in their papers, point out, because they read the argument that women's suffrage was a process already underway that probably would have happened anyway, but I have a number of students always say, well, isn't it kind of a coincidence then that it happens right after the war? 
like <laughs> yeah. if it was going to happen anyway, but it happens now. Like they were working on it for decades, and it doesn't happen until the war contribution. Right. So yeah. right. I think it's hard to argue it didn't matter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but maybe yeah. it's more how much did it matter. Right. Yeah, and I think it, it probably was, it definitely wasn't the only thing that right. got them suffrage, but it was perhaps the, the straw that broke the camel's back, right. uh, so to speak. Um, here's another question that has a little more to do with popular culture. Um, the BBC production Down Nappy has been it's right. wildly popular here, right. and this last season that just concluded really had a lot to do with the war and how it affected the life of up, both upstairs, downstairs from the TV show. Have any of you um, have any of you watched the show, and what's your opinion of its historical perspective and its usefulness for um, students and I haven't watched it. The the question was about Downton Abbey, which in the second season focuses on World War One a lot, and what's our opinion of the historical accuracy? I've only seen season one, so I'm waiting for season two to come out on DVD. Um, so I can't really speak to that either. Um, I've I've seen both seasons. I've seen season one and season two, um, and I've enjoyed it. I, I thought it was a lot of fun. Um, as far as the historical accuracy goes, um, I guess my sense is that the the um, the main character, the hero, who who's, seems to be very badly wounded and he almost miraculously recovers, um, I found that profoundly disturbing because for many of these soldiers, they're just not going to get that lucky. And um, we, I think what's very important, especially when we think about gender roles, is that one of the reasons why the war was so difficult is that women had to take care of men who were very badly wounded. And there wasn't going to be there, – there was a pension system set up for soldiers, that's true. Um, we do see in Down Abbey, you might remember the character, I believe her name is Daisy. She gets married at, right at the last minute to Will, William, who ends up dying. Um, and she's entitled to um, a, a pension as the widow of a soldier. And those, those pensions for women were actually quite important. That was a new development at the time, um, not in the United States because women had been getting pensions earlier, but certainly in Europe, the idea of a widow's pension was quite new. Um, but So I, I think that, that was interesting as far as stressing that aspect of it. Um, but we have to remember that most women, they, they, they would probably have to deal with someone who was possibly suffering shell shock, not the majority of men, but that's a very difficult thing to deal with. Um, men who were not able to work any longer and I don't, we don't really get a sense of that from Down Abbey. So I think in, in that broader perspective, it was a weakness. But it's still worth watching. It was, it was still fun. It's still a great show. It's still a great show. And I think that they are trying to get at that class difference between upstairs and downstairs. Um, and I think that's, I think it's important for them to capture that. It seems to me that those relationships are, are, are closer than I would expect them to be. I think there would have been a little bit more friction between upstairs and downstairs. Thank you. Um, here's a comment, but it just, it's, it's one you might, you might uh, include on, uh, unless you have more questions. Uh, the Uncle Sam, the famous Uncle Sam Wants You poster mm -hmm. is, right. uh, was illustrated by a, a man named James Montgomery Flagg, mm -hmm. who uh, was a Horace Mann School graduate. Yeah. Really? Oh, really? Really? And that's that is, <laughs> No, I idea. think and that is his. It, that is his. I think maybe Greg, you should yeah, repeat that. Here I think you're going to have to say that just so the audience can hear. That's fantastic. Hi, I'm I'm Greg Zaroski. I've been I've been monitoring the questions, but we have a comment, a reminder, that the Uncle Sam poster that was featured earlier in the in the presentation here, the famous "I Want You" poster, uh, that was uh, developed in um, 1917, uh, was actually done by an artist, James Montgomery Flagg who was a Horace Mann School graduate, and the poster itself uh, is his self-portrait. He used wow. his, own, his own picture wow. for that. Oh, so we have, a, we have a, a very specific uh, connection to Horace Mann School, which is celebrating its 125th anniversary um, uh, this year, and we have an interest in finding out more about the, both the women and men um, graduates from the school who, who no doubt served in the war and returned, uh, some of them uh, returned to, to life here in the United States, and we'd like to learn more about them. So that's, that's a project that we would like to uh, 
to continue to look at. Well, I had no idea. Yeah. I, I said, yeah, I'm going to get to point it out to you. Yeah. Right. yeah, I just learned something. <laughs> I didn't know. <laughs> um, that's the question, but uh, do you have a concluding kind of thing? Otherwise, okay. Victoria can... I think that was a great way to wrap up. Yeah. Um, good note to end on. Good note to end on. So thanks so much for joining us. And um, I, my understanding is that this will be online available. It's going to be people. online. It will, we'll, um, uh, it'll be through, through WebEx, but we'll put it on our, our uh, website. It takes us about uh, 40, 48 hours, about okay. two hours, and we'll have it up on our website uh, along with earlier uh, alumni webcasts. So it looks like you'll be able to access a number of webcasts from the website, and I'm sure that Greg will be able to provide you with that information. Thanks so much. Have a good night.